Because St. Luke was writing before the calendar system that we have today, the best way to indicate the time setting was to mention who the worldly leaders were. So St. Luke mentions that Caesar Augustus was Roman Emperor and Quirinius was governor of Syria before he begins the narrative of God's incarnation in the flesh, the nativity of Jesus Christ. It reminds us that Christ was a real person, just like us, yet at the same time entirely unlike us because he was truly Emmanuel, God with us. During this time, there was a decree from Caesar Augustus that there would be a census of everyone in the Roman Empire, which stretched over most of the known world. This census was for the purpose of taxing all of the people who lived within the borders of the empire. In order to get an accurate accounting of everyone, they had to travel back to their ancestors' cities. This was done because many small towns such as Nazareth were nomadic towns which were transient because people would follow the harvest and where jobs were available. Not following the decree to return to one's home city could have been considered tax evasion and would have been punishable even by crucifixion. Joseph and his betrothed Mary, who was noticeably pregnant by this time, had to travel by foot from Nazareth to Bethlehem, which took them a while. Most English translations say, Joseph also went up from Galilee with Mary, his betrothed wife, who was with child. The word wife, however, would be better translated as woman. Another common misunderstanding through translations is the referring to the child in Mary's womb as her firstborn son. The word in Greek is prototokon, which does not mean first of others, but is used to mean one to open the womb. The prototokon, or firstborn, would be the one offered to the Lord. Yet another issue of confusion through weak translation, this time from the nativity narrative according to St. Matthew, is concerning the ever-virginity of Mary. It says that Joseph did not know her till she had brought forth her firstborn son. Till, or until, does not mean that he knew her after the birth, but it means even until now. This language appears commonly in the Old Testament. Mary is referred to in the Gospel as Parthenos, which means an ever-virgin who would have never had relations with a man. This is what she was dedicated as in the temple as a three-year-old girl. Joseph was advanced in age, and so he was the perfect guardian for Mary. Jesus is referred to as the son of Mary in scripture, but the other children are never referred to as Mary's children. They were St. Joseph's children from his first marriage with his wife, Salome, who had left him a widower. These children include James, the first bishop of Jerusalem and author of the Epistle of James, Jude, the author of the Epistle of Jude, and Salome, who was one of the mirror-bearing women, and was married to Zebedee, and mother to James and John, the disciples. Nowhere in the Bible do we find reference to Mary and Joseph being married, only betrothed. The Proto-Evangelium, or First Gospel, according to St. James, gives us information on the early life of the Virgin Mary, her betrothal to Joseph, and the birth of Christ. By the time Joseph and Mary got to Bethlehem, the city was packed with people, and so there was nowhere for them to stay. They ended up staying in a cave, which was commonly used as a sable in those days. The manger that Christ was placed in was a feeding tub for the animals. In the ancient world, great leaders would brag of their extravagant beginnings. It showed that the person was born for greatness and chosen by the gods. Christ's narrative, however, was the exact opposite. His beginning would have been embarrassing in the ancient world, since he came from a poor family and was born in a barn. Some try to discredit Christ and the Gospel by saying that Christ's birthday was the 25th of December only to Christianize the pagan feast of the birth of Mithras. However, historical records don't actually indicate Mithras' birth was celebrated around the 25th. These heretical ideas are conjured only to make Christianity seem as fake as their own claims. Now there were in the same country, shepherds living out in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. The word country, chora in Greek, meant the area outside or around the city. The shepherds were nomadic and low in society. They were living and sleeping in the fields with their sheep when an angel appeared to the shepherds. This was the birth announcement of Christ the true King. 
The birth announcement of a future king would have gone out to the rich and powerful first, then to all the kingdom. Here, it went out only to the simplest, poorest, the homeless peasant shepherds. Christ is more concerned with faithful people than he is with the royal and the rich. The sign given to the shepherds was that they would find a babe wrapped in swaddling cloths lying in a manger. The angel declared to the shepherds, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. In this doxology, the angels are praising God, but there is also a hidden meaning. The word peace here is important. Caesar Augustus, who was Roman emperor during this time, proclaimed a Pax Romana, which means Roman peace. This meant that the Romans would execute anyone who caused trouble. Caesar saw this as a gift to the world because he was going to bring peace by force. He also gave himself the title, Savior of the World. Of course, God's peace is much different. God's peace simply exists. It is divine energies working in harmony. Man had, all through the Old Testament, declared war on God. Here, however, God is proactively making peace as his gift towards man. Eight days after Christ was born, he submits to the law and is circumcised, and receives his name, Jesus, the name given by the archangel before he was conceived in the womb. The name Jesus is the English version of the Hebrew and Aramaic name Yeshua. It is the same name as Joshua, which means salvation. The name Jesus was used as a translation preference in English based off of the Latin to distinguish Jesus Christ from the other men of the Old Testament who shared the same name. As we saw earlier, Jesus was the prototon, the firstborn of the Theotokos. He was the one who opened his mother's womb. He is also the only child in history to open his mother's womb as opposed to the father opening the womb. In the Old Testament law, the firstborn animal would be sacrificed to the Lord. Humans were not physically sacrificed, but symbolically. By bringing them to the temple, they were offered to God, and an animal would be sacrificed in their place. This tradition came not only from the Old Testament law, but was prefigured in Abraham and Isaac, when Isaac was replaced as the sacrifice by a ram. We still do this today in the Orthodox Church at the 40-day churching. We offer the child to God, but of course, there are no more animal sacrifices. The sacrifice was supposed to be a large animal, like a lamb, but the two turtle doves or pigeons were the offering for poor people who could not afford more. This showed Christ's poverty. Christ is not only the firstborn of Mary, but he is known as the firstborn of all creation. So this presentation to the temple was especially meaningful because the traditions of the Old Testament were fulfilled through Jesus Christ. In the Orthodox Church, we continue to present our children to the temple at 40 days, but we do it differently than was done in the Old Testament, because the Old Testament law was fulfilled in Christ, and we now celebrate things differently. An example of this is Pascha. The Jews celebrated Pascha, and so do we, but we do not celebrate the Passover that they did. We celebrate the fulfillment, which is Christ's resurrection and destruction of death. In that way, we no longer offer just bits and pieces of our life to God, like under the law. We now offer our whole being to God. We no longer offer our firstborn to God, but all of our children are churched and given over to God. We symbolically offer everything that we have back to God. Saint Simeon was a righteous man. This is in contrast to all of the great corruption which existed in the temple during this time. The Holy Spirit is upon Simeon, so that means he is a prophet. Our tradition teaches us that Saint Simeon was one of the translator of the Septuagint, that is, the Hebrew Old Testament into Greek. This was done two to three hundred years before the birth of Christ. So this would make Simeon very old, yet still in his human body. The story goes that, as Simeon was translating the book of Isaiah, he came to the part that said, A virgin shall give birth to a son. He thought that this could not be right, and so he substituted the word virgin with young girl. An angel of the Lord came to him and told him that he was wrong, 
and to change it back to virgin. The angel told him that he would not die until he saw this prophecy fulfilled with his own eyes. That day, Simeon was going to the temple to worship, and on his way there he saw Jesus and recognized him immediately as the salvation of the world. This is in contrast to many of the gospel who did not recognize Jesus as God when they see him. Simeon recognizes Christ because he is righteous and has the Holy Spirit. The song of Saint Simeon goes, Now lettest thou thy servant depart in peace, O Master, according to thy word. For mine eyes have seen thy salvation, which thou hast prepared before the face of all people, a light of revelation to the Gentiles, and a glory to thy people Israel. Simeon died one day later. He died in peace because he no longer had to fear death, knowing that Christ the Messiah had come to destroy death. Christ came for all people, Gentiles and Israelites. God had already revealed himself to the Jews on Mount Sinai, but now Christ is going to reveal himself to the Gentiles. In the book of Acts, the other book of St. Luke, we see the gospel going out to the Gentiles. Christ is the glory of his people Israel. After his song, Simeon speaks specifically to Mary, giving a prophecy. Behold, this child is destined for the fall and rising of many in Israel, and for a sign which will be spoken against. Yes, a sword will piece through your own soul also, that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. The rise is meant for the poor and oppressed who follow Christ, but the fall is for those in power and the wealthy who deny Christ. He prophesies to the Theotokos Christ's crucifixion and that Mary will be there to watch and have her heart broken. This is the opposite side to being the birth giver of God that Mary has heard from the Archangel Gabriel, Blessed art thou among women. This is to say that although there is a blessing and privilege in being God's mother, there is also a huge responsibility to bear. The Theotokos is a model for humanity because she suffered more than anyone and was always loyal to God. We also see here the prophetess Anna. She was married for seven years from her virginity, and she probably got married around 13, became a widow around 20, and was a widow for 84 years. So she is about 104 at the time of Christ's presentation to the temple. She lived in the temple like the virgins do before the time of their womanhood. Anna came back to live in the temple after her childbearing years ended. After seeing the Lord, she began spreading the news of his coming to those looking for redemption. And after his presentation in the temple in Jerusalem, Christ returned with his parents to their home in Nazareth.